Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Live podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. Today, we are joined by Spencer Dent, founder of Closed, a win-loss services and technology firm. Welcome, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Okay, as you know, Spencer, win-loss is something we're absolutely passionate about here at Pragmatic. And on a personal level, it's one of the most powerful tools I've ever used in my career. So anytime I can talk to someone who shares my love of win-loss, such as you, I know it's going to be a great podcast. So let's just jump in and get started. For sure, for sure. This is a topic obviously near and dear to my heart, something that I find that everybody needs, and once they actually start doing it, they realize the power of it. So this is this is exciting. We're excited to share so some time exciting. together talking about it. All right. First, let's give a little bit of context to our audience. Tell me a little bit about you and your background and how you got so passionate and so involved with win loss. Yeah, for sure. So so my background is I've I've worked in a combination of sales, marketing, consulting roles. So I went to I went to graduate school. I uh, got an MBA from Duke University, and I joined Bain and Company, the management consulting firm. Um, and I worked on a variety of projects there, but most of the projects I worked on were within what they would call their go-to-market or commercial excellence practice. So I was working with a lot of sales leaders, a lot of marketing leaders, a lot of product leaders about how do you bring solutions to market? How do you sell? And, and I, I just fell even deeper in love with the concept of how do you grow a business and how do you, how do you generate revenue? And then I, after, after Bain, I was, I was actually recruited by a company called Qualtrics. Uh, that many folks involved in marketing know and understand that at the time they had about 300 employees and they didn't have any kind of formalized go-to-market strategy or measurement. And they hired me and, and a couple other folks to stand up a sales revenue operations team. And so at Qualtrics, I put a lot of the things that I'd learned at Bain through consulting into practice. And we had a lot of success there. And the time I was there, they went from about 300 to 1800 employees and the revenue grew by about five times. We were opening up offices all over the world and saw a lot of experience there. And, and, and honestly, given what Qualtrics does, a, they're a feedback focus. They want to understand people's experience experiences in a scaled way through their technology. That's where this idea of win loss really kind of crystallized in my head um, along with the other founder of closed and, and we left Qualtrics to start this business. So let's talk a little bit about what you mean by win-loss. Uh, as much as it, it seems second nature to us, I actually don't know that it's consistently defined across the way. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to you and then how you guys interact with that at Closed. Yeah, great, great question. It's, the analogy I'll give you is this. 10 years ago, people started talking about things like voice of the customer and customer satisfaction and customer experience and all these things. And what was interesting is there were, because it was this emerging practice, people didn't actually really understand or clearly define what it is, but they knew it was important. And so you had things emerge like NPS measurement, things like that. Now, pretty much every company is trying to get some type of NPS or customer satisfaction score, and they're doing it in a very scaled way. Well, that's kind of how win loss is today, you know. For win loss can mean a lot of different things. For a product marketer, they can think about this as, oh, win loss means I do in depth buyer interviews. But for a sales operations leader, it can mean, well, win loss is the list of things that I put in a, 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 as a drop down in our CRM, so that when sales reps close out deals, they actually have to fill that in. And win loss for a product leader could be, I go and I interview churn customers that have left and I figure out what about my product didn't work for them. The problem is, is that it's too fragmented of a, of a definition, depending upon who you talk to. And the right way to look at it is more holistically. Win loss is the pro is the systematic and programmatic approach to understanding why you win and lose revenue from your customers. Why do you, why do they choose you up front? Why do they choose you again? Why do they, why do they choose? Why do they not choose you up front, or why do they leave you down the road? Every company knows that they need to understand this concept, 
but what's happening in this space is there's a lot of people recreating the wheel. So when you step back from it and you think of it more holistically, you actually will approach it with a better solution. That's really interesting too, because I think what, when I hear you talk about win loss, it's really, um, it's really a, a 3d practice, right? It's not any one aspect, uh, all of which are important, but it's really combining all of your data and then all of your data sources into one to get that sort of full robust picture of what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so a good way to think about this is we talk about it. One, one way we talk about it is channels of information. So a great way to, to a great way to understand when loss one channel is to just go look at your closed sales opportunities, the deals that have gone through your pipeline. And before you ever talk to a sales rep or before you ever talk to a buyer or interview or survey either of them, you actually just analyze what happened on the deals. And there's a lot of what you can learn there in terms of what happened. And for example, you might find there's a certain competitor that you lose to all the time, or there's a certain industry that you just can't get traction in, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the, one of the points or things that you really want to focus on is that's a good way to start. Like what is happening? Where are we winning? Where are we losing? Second channel, you can go to your sales team. The beauty of your sales team is you, they, they can and should give you feedback on every single deal that they work. You don't have to get deep feedback from them. In fact, you probably don't want deep feedback from them because they start to speculate a lot. But you can, a good, the sales team can act as a way for you to skim your pipeline that's been closed out and figure out why are we winning or losing according to the sales team. But then the, the richest and most powerful source of why you win and lose is actually the people that make the decision, which is the buyer. So the benefit of the buyer is you can go to them and really understand in depth why, we, why they did or didn't make the choice to go with you. So using those three, to your point, right? Using those three channels of information and using them appropriately is the key to, to really uncovering why you win and lose deals. They're so powerful, each one of them, right, in their own way, but they're also not perfect, right? They're, they're, there's data that's biased. There's data that's incomplete. Uh, we've all certainly talked to buyers who, who just remember something entirely different than, you know, the record would, would indicate. Uh, and same thing with salespeople and even the data. The data gives you numbers. It doesn't give you context. But the three in combination provide a really robust and really complete story. Right. Absolutely. Classic case of if you're analyzing a situation, the best way to actually get a good understanding is to triangulate into it. So you use those three sources to bounce off each other and they can actually direct you like depending upon the order you use them. So for example, you could go research your closed pipeline and you see this example of, man, I think we're losing a lot to this one specific competitor. Okay. I'm, I'm, going to now survey my sales team or I'm going to go look and see what my sales team is saying in our CRM about why we lose to that competitor. Okay, they're saying that we lose because we're missing key product functionality. But it's very surface level. Well, guess what? I want it to be surface level because I want my sales team selling, not filling out surveys. Hmm. And so then what I do is I then use that information to go do in-depth interviews, or, or broader surveys with my buyers. And though, now that I've even, not only am I triangulating and using them, but I'm actually either confirming or disproving as I go down each step. So that if I get to the buyers and I can come back and say, yep, we're right, we're missing this key piece of functionality, we really need to build, build it. Now everybody can roll in the same direction. But if I get there and I disprove it, then I can go train my sales team and say, hey, we're off. We're, we're not hearing our people, we're not hearing our buyers correctly about what they want and what they need, and we're, we're not selling correctly to them. So whether you confirm or you disprove what the internal perspective is, it's still valuable because it helps you get everybody aligned and move the right way. Let's talk a little bit about, because we have listeners that, that work at giant uh, companies with really high ticket price products. We have work at giant companies with very small sort of monthly fee ones, and we work at some smaller companies as well. How does the win loss and the channels that we listen to, how does that vary depending on the products we offer um, and maybe the clients we work with? Fantastic question. Yeah, it's uh, a good way to think about it is this. I'll give, I'll give you a personal example that, that may bring it to life. So what, 
you buy something online, you buy something on Amazon, right? How complex is that decision for you as a, as a normal standard consumer? Not very complex, right? It, it, you can give feedback why you chose it in a really simple format, often and a survey would accommodate that. When you buy a home, that's a really complex decision. It's a long-term decision. It takes, you, it takes a while to figure out what you want. You're not actually sure what you want going into it. You go through an entire process of evaluating homes, looking at different homes. You go through an entire qualification process. You end up buying it. And at the end of that, that's a really in-depth, life-changing moment for people. If you really want to understand why I bought the home I bought, you'd be better off talking to me. And so going back to this example of what should your company use, it does depend on, on your pipeline composition. It does depend on the transaction speed of your business. So I'll give you an example. One of our clients, they're a huge business process outsourcing company. They literally have us interview every single deal that goes through their pipeline. The reason why is every single deal that goes through their pipeline on average is a 10 months sell cycle. At least the average deal size is five to $6 million with some being as high as $15 million, $20 million. This, the sales process, the amount of people involved, the investment is huge. So it totally makes sense for them to interview every single deal that goes through pipeline. Now, conversely, the total opposite side of this is we've worked with companies who their average ticket size is $1,000. And the sales team, the human-based sales team that is interacting with the person or, or with the buyer, they're having one max two conversations. The decision is made within a week. That's not a very complex, that's not a very complex deal. And so to get a broad perspective there, you may want to deploy a survey and then use interviews strategically based off of what you're hearing on the survey. Often the right answer is a mixture of both. Try to cover more, you use, you use a survey mechanism either to your reps and or your buyers to cover more pipeline to understand broadly what are they saying. And then you strategically use a third party to help you interview the buyers and really get under the, under the hood on what happened in the decision-making process. So that was a long-winded answer, but think simple transactions, you can typically accommodate with simple feedback like a, like a survey. Complex transactions have too many moving parts that a structured survey is not gonna get you the right answer. And you want to have an in-depth, flexible conversation conducted by a professional that can, actually pivot with the person. So when I say professional, you can do that internally. You can outsource it to a third party. There's options for both. So that makes sense, right? Where the depth you have and, and, and kind of where you spend the most time and, and, and uh, focus is, is dependent on your piece. But there are, it, from what you said, right? There are some consistencies, no matter what product you sell, how big, how small, and to whom, there are some consistent aspects of what a good win-loss program looks like, right? So you talked about multi-channel and you talked about real-time feedback, what else do you think really makes a, a good win-loss program? Right. So you, so you nailed that. So the real-time feedback is good. If you're win, so being super clear and candid here, if the way your company consumes win-loss feedback is sporadically or once in a while at a quarterly business review, you aggregate the things that you're pulling together and you talk about it in a big group, you're not doing this correctly. That's not going to get change in your organization. The way you get change in your organization is you push this feedback as it comes back, whether it's an interview or whether it's a simple base aggregation of survey responses, whatever it happens to be, you need to aggregate that and push it out to the relevant team members in your organization as it's available. If you do that, a couple of things will happen. One, people will actually pay attention to it and start using it day to day in how they make decisions about what product features to build or how they should change their pricing model or what sales enablement initiatives they need. All of that will, will just naturally feed into the organization. So then you'll spend your time when you get everybody together to talk about win loss, you'll be spending time to talk about what you're doing to address it instead of spending time to talk about what you think is happening and speculating. So 
the real-time thing is huge. That's best practice for any type of feedback program is to push the information to the relevant parties within, within your org in an automated fashion. And how would you suggest people do that? Like, how do we, because you want to share the information in a way that they'll consume it, right? So you don't want to overwhelm them with details, but you want to give enough to make it real. What are some best practices around communicating out with the different stakeholders? Great, great question. It needs to be relevant to them, right? So I'll give you an example. If I get, if I'm doing a win-loss interview or a, or a series of interviews for a client and I'm hearing a lot of things about product, it would be the best in the best interest of the company and the most actionable thing to do is to get the pieces of feedback that are coming through relative to product pushed to the product leader and, and, or product leadership and give them access to that feedback. So not only can they see high, high level, for example, our customers are saying that our, the ease of use on our software solution is really complex. The user experience is, is confusing. We don't really understand. Well, instead of, it's not really useful to say, hey, our ease of use sucks, <laughs> right? That, what am I supposed to do with that as a product leader? What I need is I need context around it. So not only giving me the high level, but also giving me the actual context in which the feedback was given through an interview. The other question you asked around, uh, another component of that, and this is really important, Rebecca, is you do need technology to push this and, and share it out. So in my previous experience at Qualtrics, we actually used a third-party win-loss vendor. And what we found that happened was the ability of our organization to get our hands on the feedback was limited because it was handed back to us in the form of a PDF. And that those PDFs would sit on a handful of people's desktops, not actually be shared out in real time. It was more being, it was more like getting a book report handed to you, you know, like here's 50 pages to go read. Well, guess what? Executives at companies and people that make decisions at companies don't have time to consume 50 pages of information all at once. You're better off feeding it to them in a more automated fashion. So use technology. One of them that's been, for us, I would say our client's favorite part about our solution is the fact that you can push the information to them as it becomes available, and then they can go get their or organization to engage and, and act on it. Um, another, another important part of how you push the information is also making it bite size, right? So, um, you know, the best practices for this are things like First off, recognizing how much information comes through in win-loss. So in win-loss, you get everything from competitive intelligence to product positioning to sales effectiveness to um, messaging and, and what's resonating, not resonating. You'll even get feedback about your support organization and what's going, gone well or not gone well since I signed up. Making sure you don't overwhelm everybody and spray them all in the face with a fire hose with all of that information is key. So another, another way to handle this is you can say, you can split the information out and say, Hey, this week, I'm just going to give you guys the competitor report next week. I'm going to give you the key driver or decision-making criteria. These are the things that buyers are evaluating us on today as of right now, the next week you can give win rate information. Here's what's happening with our win rate. Here's how it's trending. Here's how, here's what the implications financially for our business are of going from a 24% win rate to a 25% win rate. So giving that information in bite-sized pieces like that as well also helps people consume it and act on it versus dumping too much all at once. Makes complete sense. Let's talk about one of the, to go back a little bit. One of the channels that we talk about are the buyer interviews. And uh, it is, as you said, one of the best and most robust places, but it's probably where the most complexity comes in in the win loss program, right? It's pretty, it's pretty easy to, to get some, you know, to play with the data in the CRM system, you know, a good lunch and you guys can get your, your sales people's attention, but let's talk about the buyer interviews in particular and sort of the, the best practices of a good win loss program around those. Great question. Um, so, so when you think about, when you think about buyer interviews, there's a couple of things before you even start the interview piece that will make you successful or not successful. The first part is your ability to actually get people on the phone. And if you do get them on the phone, 
how do you have an in-depth, powerful conversation with them? And then if you ha are able to have an in-depth, powerful conversation with them, so what? Then what do you do? So there, there's components there around scheduling the interviews, transcribing the interviews, conducting or, and reporting out on the interviews that you want to have in place that are, are key. So that's best practice number one. Automation matters in win-loss interviewing. Many companies, I can't tell you the number of companies we've seen at Closed that come to us initially trying to understand this, and we want to help people with this practice. So we'll educate them. We'll give them lots of thought leadership. And they'll often say, okay, we're going to try this internally. And then six months later, they come back and they say, we've done six. And you find out where they got hung up was we couldn't get, I didn't have enough time to send a hundred emails, you know, every other week to try to get people on the phone. So that's one channel challenge. Another element of best practice that, to think about along this automation front is what do the actual deliverables look like? And, and who are you sending them to? You know, full transparency, right? If you're, if you're just giving, if you're just writing out your notes of what the person said and you're handing those off to people, they're never going to trust them and they're never going to actually feel like, okay, I got it. And by the way, that's going to take you down a lot. So the idea of having a consistent deliverable that is done in a very, with a very strong methodology around, here's what happened. Here's, here are key drivers that I heard the buyer mention. Here are the quotes that support those drivers. Here's a full transcript so you can actually go read the entire conversation. That's huge. That gives credibility to the rigor of the exercise versus I went and talked to some people and I took some notes on my phone while I was talking to them. That's not going to get the buy-in and the level of action you need. Another thing, this is, a, this, is a, this is a big question. Another element about it is, when you go do the interviews, they need to be in-depth and probing interviews. They cannot be phone interviews. They or, or sorry, not phone surveys. They can't be phone surveys. There's a very big tendency for people, especially in this space, to want to have structured feedback. And it's great to have structured feedback, but the reason, the way you get structured feedback is through a survey. You want unstructured, fluid feedback through a phone interview. The, the phone interview, the purpose of the interview is to be able to probe. So think less about designing a you know, defined questionnaire for how you're going to talk to the person and think more about what are the general topics that I want to make sure I cover with potential drill downs. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example of that. I, I did a win-loss interview yesterday. On this interview, the person spoke entirely right out of the gates you know i asked what did you do why was that the right decision the entire key drivers in the decision were around the pricing model was unclear with with this vendor with one vendor and it made me nervous about how my business would scale up with them so i wanted to choose something that would be easier for us to get in place and that we could grow with and that was the most important criteria for us so I spent the majority of the 30 minutes that I had with this person talking about what about the pricing model didn't work, why it didn't work, how, how he would suggest changing it. I also covered how did the sales team do? What was your perspective on the product? Who were the other competitors? What did they do well? What did they not do well? But I spent the majority of the time talking about that key driver. And because of that, I understood why they made the decision they made. And that is key, being adaptive in the interview. Don't feel so concerned about getting every question right because the only question that matters is why did they do what they did? And, and sometimes people get way too um, rigid in their, in their methodology. You want a flexible, strong methodology that can adapt interview to interview and overall so that when you aggregate the feedback back, you can say, hey, I've heard on the 50 interviews we've done for you so far 23 times you've lost. And of those 23 losses, 17 times they've brought up this concern around pricing rigidity and your pricing model. And here's the 17 quotes that support that. So now I have this really in-depth way of being able to show you what actually mattered on your losses. So that's a long-winded answer around what makes a good interview program, but you really want to make sure, you know, three bullets, 
as much automation as possible on the process, but a lot of flexibility and high touch service on the interview. You need a, you need a professional doing that, a person that can have that flexible conversation and you need a methodology that isn't so rigid that you will miss the boat and not actually answer why they did or didn't do what they, uh, why they did or did not purchase your, your solution. Great advice all around. And there is a lot to that and it was a long answer, but it, it's, it's important because the, there's such value in there. And, and if you burn that bridge, if you don't do it right, you don't collect the right information, you can't go back and be like, hey, sorry, buyer, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't interview you the way I should. <laughs> Can we talk again? So getting it right is key. And, and you know, here's, here's the other part about it. You'll actually make them mad. You mm-hmm. actually will make them frustrated if you're asking them questions that didn't matter to them, right? I'm, I'm giving you a, this is different than, you know, consumer-based research where you're going and you're saying, hey, fill, the, fill out these, sur- these surveys about diapers and I'll give you a $5 gift card. This is, these are professionals. These people mm-hmm. make a lot of money often, especially if they're decision makers in B2B orgs. So you have to be respectful of their time and you need to focus on what really mattered to them in the decision. So that, that's also important is, is it, you can't go back to them after and if they feel like you're wasting your time, mm-hmm. their time in, in it, it's also not a very good experience. Conversely, if they have a really in-depth conversation with you where they can share and where you can drill in, they'll actually really feel listened to and it will reflect well on your company. That's so true, right? I mean, if they are getting questions that they feel like they could have answered in a survey or that you should have the information to in your CRM, that is not worth their time. That is not, hey, I really value your feedback and your conversation. So it's Super good point. Yep. So we talked a lot about best practices. Let's just do real quick. Let's just look at the, the inverse of that, right? So what are some really common pitfalls that you see with companies that you've worked with or companies that you think, oh, we should have worked with them uh, where their, their win-loss programs maybe aren't as successful as they should be? Yeah, for sure. Um, the first common mistake is that it's a very siloed effort. There's one person working on this buried in the, in the product marketing organization that's assigned to competitive intelligence and they work on this. Not a lot of other people are involved and the feedback, they, they basically do the, the project and they report out to an executive team. Very fragment. So that's the siloed piece. The fragmented piece is you have somebody in sales ops collecting feedback, somebody on the product marketing team doing interviews and somebody on the product team doing churn interviews and nobody actually knows what each other are doing they're actually reaching out to the same people in some cases for feedback. And that's frustrating to actually your buyers. And, and so fragmented and siloed, that's one common mistake. You want this, a broad cross-functional effort with the right stakeholders involved, particularly from your sales marketing and product organizations that are all rowing in the same direction that are getting the answers, most important answers for them shared and that are working through problems together. That's the first one. This, the, if you don't do that, you'll run into this other problem where the insights get stuck in a single team. So there's one team that's doing win loss and you know, the product, if the product marketing team, you know, is just coming up every six months or every quarter to tell the sales team and the product team why they aren't doing a good job, that's not going to be effective either. Right. So you want the information flowing out across the organization. And then another mistake that companies make is their methodologies are are weak. And and what I mean by that is the way you the way you approach the questions you're trying to answer don't line up with the output you actually need. So I'll give you an example. Almost every company has some type of CRM field where they're asking the reps why they won or lost. So I lose a deal and this thing's automatically triggered and it says, give me your loss reason. And these are the reasons, and I can't tell you the number of companies that I've seen this happen with. The reasons in their loss fields are, I lost to a competitor. I lost because of product gaps. I lost because of pricing. I lost because of something else. Well, guess what? You often do lose to competitors because of pricing or because of product gaps. And you, and so basically you're, you're giving me a single pick or even multi pick, you know, drop down that doesn't allow me to actually give you accurate information. Cause I'm saying, cause it's all of those things, not just one of those things. So 
the way it's actually set up oftentimes by companies, they wonder why they can't trust anything out of it. It's because it's set up poorly. Another example of that is phone surveys, right? You go do a phone survey. One thing that was super frustrating to me in the past when I was a consumer of this in industry was coming back and having what appeared to be a phone survey. The person who did the interview, the example, I would say, you know, Rebecca, the problem is the product just couldn't do what we needed it to do. It, it, it was just missing a lot. And the person conducting the interview went and said, okay, what was the sales experience like? Like, where, where's the drill down? Where's the, where's the double click? And so that's a, other common mistakes is you, you just don't make sure that you uncover as much as what you could. And then at the end of the day, this is all about driving action, right? So you got to make sure you engage the right stakeholders up front. You want to use, um, you want to create a culture where people value this, where they seek it and where it's made trans, where the feedback that, especially that's coming back from the buyers is transparent and valued. And at the end of the day, there are situations where the buyer will remember something differently from the sales team. Guess what? That's fine. At the end of the day, the buyer is who matters. At the, at the, at the end of the day, the buyers are the ones that spend the money. So there's a little bit of, a uh, cultural dose of humility that needs to be in that companies need to 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 take when it comes to win loss. Otherwise, they're not going to change and they're not going to be able to act on it. So we talked a lot about best practices. We talked about things we see people do wrong. If someone doesn't have, for shame, a win loss program in place today, how would you recommend them get started? What are the the three things that they need to do first, or really focus on to get something launched? Yeah, good question. First one is you have to understand the value at stake. One of my favorite quotes ever, we actually had, uh, our team uh, does a lot of, puts together a lot of web, uh, webinars and, and podcasts like this. And one of my favorite quotes ever from one of our clients was, just start the damn program. Just go. Because what you'll find is that once you get moving, like, and it, you don't have to start big, you don't have to do a ton of things. Just go do a couple of win-loss interviews. Just go figure out a way to aggregate the feedback from your sales team and push it out in a more simple way. And there's a lot of content out there to help you do that, but just get started. One of the things that can help you get started, fully understanding the value at stake. You know, if, if you understand, if companies understood that just improving their win rate by 1% for many companies is, is literally the difference between hitting their numbers and not hitting their numbers. And so the, if you, if you feel, if you understand the dollar value at stake, it, it makes it really easy. You want to shift from a, what I would say a project or kind of tiger team mentality to an operationalized mentality. This is something you want to focus on. You want to get people bought into, you want to get people and you want it to be done in an ongoing way as much as possible. And then you got to get buy-in. And, and, and when I say get buy-in, there's one team in particular that you need to get buy-in from, and that is the sales org. The, so these are their accounts. This is how they make money. This is how they feed themselves and their families. They are very protective about their accounts. They're very protective about, frankly, in some cases, their egos. So it's kind of hard sometimes for sales teams to get this idea around their head of, wait, people are going to go talk to my accounts where I lost and get feedback on how I performed. I don't know how I feel about that. You need to make it safe for them. They can't feel like it's a witch hunt. It can't feel like you know, you're trying to get people in trouble. It needs to feel like, hey, listen, there's a lot that we need to learn about from a product marketing and sales perspective that we can do better. And the purpose and goal of this is to help you hit your number. The purpose and goal of this is to give you better tools and a better product to sell and better training so you can be more effective. So they, they do get the sense that they're, they have the most at risk and you really want to focus on getting them on board. If you can get them on board, you'll do great. Make sure you have that cross-functional support, especially at the executive level. That will help you get started. Um, another option is to use a third party. Third, par third parties can avoid internal bias. Obviously, I own and operate a third-party win-loss solution. You know, there, there is power, not just internally, but externally. Buyers will share things with third parties that they won't share with, with, you, with or reps from your company. And buyer and third parties, because they're a, you know independent third party, the feedback will be more digested or more easily digested into your org. 
And then the last thing, if, if you're just trying to get started right now and you want to learn more about this, there's a lot that we have going on. Um, we're, we're, we're actually with pragmatic marketing, we're launching a, a survey to help companies see where they're at in terms of best practices. So we invite everybody to participate in that. We'll give you uh, findings from the feedback there. The, if you want to take that survey and get the results, the, the link that you would go to is tinyurl.com backslash state of win loss. That will take you to the survey. You fill out that survey. And then once we aggregate the feedback with pragmatic together, we'll share it out a report and it can help you understand kind of where you are on the maturity curve of, of win loss. And then lastly, and this is actually probably the best resource for you if you're trying to get started, uh, come to win loss week. You can go register at winlossweek.com. That is going to be, that's a, think of that as a week long event with a series of webinars and um, best practices coming from industry, industry leaders, from uh, co companies that are practicing this. Closed is, closed is hosting it, but we are just acting as the forum and the launch board and platform for companies to share. So you'll have companies like Pragmatic Marketing participating. You'll have companies like uh, Bain and Company participating. You'll have industry companies like um, SAP, Qualtrics, Salesforce, et cetera, that are going to come and share how they practice win loss in their organization. So that's a great way to just get you up to speed and, and you'll learn a lot, I'm sure. Like a boot camp for a week. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. We're, su we're super excited about it. And what's, what's interesting, it shows you how interested people are in this is we came up with this idea of let's do a day series. And there was so much interest from the from partners and, and our clients and other companies in this in the space to participate that bloated up into a week. So maybe it'll be maybe it'll be end up being even longer, but we'll try <laughs> right. But it'll it's all on demand webinars that you can consume at, at your own pace. And I think it if, if I was starting, I could have I could have really used the help when we were doing this before to know kind of where to hunt and, where, and how to approach this problem. Awesome. And I know that on your site, you also have some other great resources, as do we. Uh, you've got a win-loss guide that's fantastic. Uh, and so if people check it out, I think they'll get some, some good actionable advice uh, yeah, that they sure. can use right away. For sure. If it, We have a lot of stuff at close.com on our blog you can look at. We have a, a win-loss guide that you, can, that you can download that gives you a lot of information. Pragmatic has great content that are related to this. So there, there's content out there. and You just got to know where to go to get it. Absolutely. And hopefully, Spencer, when the survey results come back, we can uh, get together again and talk about them and what they said and, and what we, where we were surprised, where it confirmed, and what we think that means. So that'll be a fun conversation as well. Yeah, we're super excited about it. It's going to be great. All right, Spencer, my, missed my favorite last question. Uh, we talked a lot about a lot of different things today. If you were going to do two, if you're going to have listeners do two things differently tomorrow, Based on what we talked about today, what would it be? Uh, the first thing would be to realize that in a B2B organization, there's a lot of complexity. And the way you cut through the complexity is listening to your buyer. And if you go listen to your buyer, you're going to be, that gives you all the ammo in the world to cut through the complexity of your own organization and get things done. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing would be, then just go do it. Go figure out how to engage buyers, people that are spending money on your solution or choosing not to spend money and figure out what's driving those decisions. If you do that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you get everybody rowing in the right direction. There's no better or more powerful solution for driving alignment in an organization than win-loss done right. Good advice. All right. Thank you, Spencer. This was a great conversation and I thoroughly enjoyed having you on today. Thanks so much. Have a great day. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thanks everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career. 